Hello, and welcome to World Campus from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're coming to you from Film Scene in downtown Iowa City. This is part two of a three-part series on food, and uh, this time we're going to talk about how we eat, what we eat, and how we connect as communities around food. I'd like to remind you that you're invited to attend these live tapings uh, here at Film Scene. Otherwise, you can catch these programs later on UITV, YouTube, iTunes, and the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. For more information about Film Scene, uh, check out icfilmscene.org. Uh, so in this segment, I have three very interesting folks who are going to give us some perspective I, I know we're going to enjoy. Just next to me is Kurt Fries, the owner and chef of Devotee Restaurant and Bar in Iowa City. Thank you for being here, Kurt. Great to be here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, next to Kurt is Colleen Tyson, a Special Collections Outreach and Instruction Librarian at the University of Iowa Libraries. Thanks for coming, Colleen. Of course. Mm -hmm. And Kristen Porter is at the far end. Uh, she's an Iowa native and a creator of the food <coughs> blog, Iowa Girl Eats. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to throw this uh, first uh, set of questions to you, Kurt. You're uh, our chef. You own a restaurant that's a very successful restaurant here in our area, uh, an independent restaurant. And I know that, that you have lots of passions about food, about local sourcing, about creating, trying new dishes all the time. Mm -hmm. How did you develop this passion for food? Oh, uh, wow. Geez, goes uh, pretty far back, I guess. Um, some of my earliest memories are uh, there was an Easter ham that we did every year, and it was my job at three and four years old to stand on a stool and stir the, the raisin sauce that my mom got the recipe from the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook with the, with the red and white checkered uh, plaid cover on it. I still, I still have that and still occasionally make that sauce mm -hmm. some 40 years later. Um, <laughs> But um, at my house, food has always been uh, integral to what we do. Uh, it, it, is, it was very common for us to be uh, sitting around a Saturday lunch decide, talking about what we were going to be having for dinner and, uh, and who was going to make what and who was going to go to what store to find it. Or, um, and so it wasn't too surprising that I found myself uh, working my way through high school and college in the in the food industry and um, making some discoveries along the way and one of them is that uh, fresh tastes best. Mm. Simple enough uh, of an idea but the fact is that the closer the source is to my kitchen door the fresher it's going to be. I don't care how fast your planes and trains and trucks are. Uh, so that's what started steering me toward this idea of local food and when I got into the business uh, to start with, which was uh, 1979, 1980, restaurants were judged at the time by uh, how distant and exotic their ingredients were. I remember New Zealand lamb was a new thing that everybody was very excited about. And what I've had the privilege of, of observing throughout my uh, now 35 year career in, in this industry is that it's switched completely. It's a full 180 to where now restaurants quality is judged by how local their ingredients are. Uh, we've, we've, we've made some progress, yeah. I think. <laughs> well, and restaurants like yours have helped drive that, right? I mean, you... We, we've been doing our part. We, Devotee's been around for 18 years, mm -hmm. and when we opened, we were the only restaurant in town that was buying anything mm -hmm. locally. One of the only businesses, New Pioneer Co-op was, was the other one, but they're a grocery not a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, now, off the top of my head, I could quickly rattle off more than a dozen that yeah. at least buy something local mm -hmm. and several that, buy, that have as much of a passion as we do about it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Was it hard at the beginning to find the, the uh, farmers you could provide? <laughs> yes, it was very it. hard. When yeah. I opened, I only knew one farmer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a city boy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that, was, uh, that was Simone Delati, um, uh, formerly of the university and now retired on her beautiful farm near Wellman, and she introduced me to another who introduced me to several more, and now we have uh, more than 40 what we call Devotee Local Farm Partners. Mm -hmm. um, people we buy from, some of them we buy from them throughout the year, like James Nisley, who has uh, the sprouts and they're indoors, so he's, he's always got those. Some of them we only buy asparagus from them for two weeks and then it's gone. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, 
in addition to local sourcing, you have also championed the slow food uh, um, movement. Yes. <laughs> slow food movement. I know Kurt has al also been involved in the slow food movement. I slow have cookies. for uh, yeah. s Slow Food is an international organization, uh, an educational organization um, that was founded in the mid 80s in Italy, uh, uh, originally as a response to McDonald's uh, deciding to open their first uh, restaurant in Italy, uh, and they had the unmitigated temerity of, to do it at the foot of the Spanish Steps in Rome, which is, you know, a lot like opening a hog butchery in the middle of Jerusalem. They, they were uh, incensed, and they launched a, uh, a protest. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been to the Spanish Steps, but it's a relatively small piazza, and they had a little over 100,000 people <laughs> flowing, flowing through this yeah. uh, protest, where, and they fed them all um, uh, penne pomodoro, simple pasta and tomato yeah. uh, uh, thing. F fed over 100,000 people this, this pasta yeah. thing, and nobody went into the, the McDonald's on their very first day. Yeah. Yeah. And the founder, Carlo Petrini, he thought that was going to be it. He thought that was going to be the, the, you know, the one scream into the abyss, <laughs> and now he'd go back to his home in, in, in Bra and eat his wonderful food on his own, but uh, there, there was too much passion behind it. So a couple of years later, there was, a, uh, there was a gathering in Paris, and it became this international movement that they decided to call slow food, because in Europe, when they say fast food, they don't say it in German or French or Italian or Spanish. They say it in English. They call it fast food. So when they wanted to rebel against it, they used the English words and called it slow food. Uh, as a result, there are now uh, about 175,000 members around, around the world uh, in almost every country. Um, uh, the United States now has more members than Italy itself does. Um, and the organization is doing great. I, I launched the first chapter here in, in Iowa in 2000. Um, there are now seven chapters around the state. And I've lost count how many there are around the country, 200 and something. But the idea behind it, I mean, the, the, what, what do you think when you say, I, I want to be part of the slow food movement? Is it about making it yourself? It doesn't matter if it it's takes a, a little longer. It's long about or. cooking, to, uh, no doubt. And um, I've come to the conclusion that America doesn't really have a food problem so much as it has a cooking problem. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten how, or we never learned, or, mm -hmm. or we think that it's um, difficult or, or expensive or time consuming. And it's none of those things. It's, <laughs> Believe me, if it was rocket surgery, I wouldn't have been doing it my whole life. Uh, but slow food is basically about uh, creating a, recreating a food system that is good, clean, and fair. And by good, we mean that it's good tasting, that it's good for you, that it's good for the environment. Um, by clean, we mean that there's nothing in the food that isn't food. Yeah. <laughs> and if it wasn't food 100 years ago, it's still not food now. <laughs> And by fair, we mean that the people who produce the food should be justly compensated for the work they put into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our current yeah. food system, for the most part, is none of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we were laughing before this program. He said, you know, I might be the only restaurant owner you're ever going to talk to who will say that he's upset that people are not staying at home and cooking more. <laughs> and and uh, you may be singular in that, in that feeling. Yeah, I'm not a very good restaurant owner. But, oh no, no, but... Uh, <laughs> But I take the point. Yeah, we, we, we got sold a bill of goods. Um, uh, the American people did. The Western world did. Um, 60, 70, 80 years ago, something like that. Uh, we got tricked. We got, we got flim flammed. I got bamboozled into this idea that cooking is a chore, like mm -hmm. washing windows or doing the laundry mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. And it's not. Cooking is, first of all, Applying heat to the food is one of the very few elemental things that separates us from the rest of the animal world. Mm -hmm. um, it's a downright spiritual thing. It's, it's the most tangible way that we demonstrate our love to our family and our friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to blow that off, yeah. to, to feed our families in much the same way we fuel our cars, and it these days with the same ingredient, mm -hmm. corn. <laughs> um, we, in a, I mean, in <laughs> Iowa, we, we don't grow food anymore. Yeah. We, grow, we grow feed and fuel. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, thankfully, uh, Devotee and many other restaurants in the area have found 
lots of wonderful farmers doing the right thing in, in small little groups, but we've got, uh, we've got a political system and a cultural idea that goes in exactly the wrong direction. I mean, the oldest cliche in the world is you are what you eat, right? Yeah. And there's, it's one of the oldest cliches because it's very, very true. You literally are what you eat. Your children are what you feed them. But if we are what we eat, then most Americans are fast, cheap, and easy. And that doesn't, it, that's not a way to, to, build, a, to build a world. We've got a, we've got a world where um, any child b born after the year 2000 has a one in three shot of developing early onset diabetes before he's old enough to vote. If they're among min minorities, one in two. Now, I don't care how you reform the, the health care system, no health care system can tolerate a population that's half diabetic. It can't be done. So we've got to start talking about prevention rather than cure. Well, that's a good, good start for this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, Kristen, I think I, I might go down to you next because you are, I, I introduced you as a food blogger. You are obviously a gal who loves to eat, who loves to cook, and uh, you care enough about it to have started this blog up some time ago. And, uh, and now it's more than a private passion. You have followers all over the world. Uh, tell us how you got into this in the first place and what keeps you going. Yeah, um, well, I got into food blogging because I was bored, <laughs> actually. Um, I got married in 2008 and had spent the year prior very busy with wedding planning and found myself married and with a lot of time on my hands. Um, and at the time, I uh, had been reading a lot of health and fitness blogs, um, had a passion for healthy eating and fitness. And the blogs that I was reading were written by women who were very similar to myself. And so I thought, you know what, I, I'm passionate about this topic as well. I feel like I have something to contribute to this space. And so I started the blog. It was on a free WordPress um, uh, theme and slowly it, ch it, it uh, changed from a fitness kind of health uh, focus to more recipe focused and and the reason why I, tr I uh, kind of focus more on recipes is because like you mentioned people have really forgotten how to cook and I saw um, a lot of people in my life who were getting takeout and going to McDonald's for, for dinner and feeding their children fast food. And it was like, you guys, this is so simple. Like, it's not as hard as you might think it is. Uh, so the focus of my blog and what I've really chosen to focus on is uh, simple, wholesome meals that you can prepare in usually 30 minutes for, for certain under an hour uh, using ingredients you can get at the grocery store. No special internet orders required. No multiple trips to here, there, there, there. Um, uh, in season, I mentioned um, food that you can feel good about cooking and feeding your family and your children in particular, um, and, and taking pride in what you're making and feeling really good about that. So that's what I focused, um, that's what I've chosen to focus the blog on for uh, the, the past three, four years. Well, I know uh, recently, uh, the last few years, you discovered that you yourself had uh, an allergy to gluten, that you, you have to eat gluten-free now, and that at mm -hmm. first this was something you had to kind of wrestle with in terms of what you were saying and doing on your blog. Yeah, I uh, was diagnosed with celiac disease last year after um, my son was born, and I was really totally thrown for a loop. I thought I had to quit food blogging. I was like, you know, what, is this, what does this mean for me? Because um, I, I just didn't know what eating gluten-free meant. And I had heard it, um, you know, obviously everywhere. You know, the term is, is very popular, but very few people, including myself last year, knew what it meant. And so I um, very quickly became educated in what eating gluten-free meant. Um, and that simply means no wheat, barley, rye. Um, but what it does mean is eating fresh foods. So meats, vegetables, fruits, grains like rice, quinoa. And, and so I really focused on what I could eat, and, and the things that I couldn't eat were very, it was a very short list, and it was foods that I shouldn't be eating anyway. It was um, cakes, pastries, traditional pasta, pizzas, which is fine for an occasional, I love them, <laughs> don't get me wrong, and there are amazing gluten-free pastas, but they're foods, but they're, the point is, is that there's so much um, food that I can still eat, and so one of uh, the things that I've really taken pleasure in this past year is educating my readers and, and anyone who will listen 
that um, gluten-free isn't a fad. It's for some people, including myself, I don't want to be dramatic, but it could mean life or death. Um, it's something to take seriously, and it's, it's not about deprivation at all. So. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, we'll go now for a moment. I want to talk a little bit about recipes that are in the University of Iowa Special Collections <coughs> collection because Colleen is going to talk to us about that. And these uh, recipes that are in special collections go back hundreds of years, don't they? Yes. Many countries. Yes, absolutely. So the University of Iowa Special Collections is home to the Zathmary Culinary Collection, um, the bulk of which all came from one collector, Chef Louis Zathmary. Um, more than 20,000 cookbooks now. Um, hundreds of handwritten, um, so people's handwritten cookbooks from hundreds of years of history, um, basically stretching from the year 1499 to the present. And it is a collection that we keep up now today by, by buying the new cookbooks as well. So <laughs> everything from a Latin cookbook from 1499 to Hannah Hart's cookbook from YouTube um, today, uh, and everything in between. And uh, that that gives a lot of material to draw from <laughs> to talk about recipes. Um, one of our projects that's been going on in the past few years is that we digitized all of the handwritten cookbooks and put them on our site called DIY History. Um, and people from all around the world have been helping us transcribe them and uh, figure out what the handwriting says in these pers people's personal cookbooks from history. And that's really brought out a lot of revelations about the history of recipes and the way that we eat. Um, it's been, it brings up a lot, of a lot of ingredients that we don't use quite as much anymore that you would see again and again in 19th century cookbooks. Um, calf's head stew <laughs> comes up again and again, you know, and that's definitely not something that we think of as a typical family meal these days. Um, but the other thing that's been really interesting in looking back at historic recipes is to see exactly what the two of you have been talking about is some of what was lost that we're trying to help find again. You know, the recipes will say, bake in the usual way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have some grandmother's recipes that are. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's exactly it, you know, and each of these recipes was someone's grandmother, and so we, we have that connection to it, too. You know, when we look at back at recipes, even just a couple of generations ago, there's already some knowledge that's been lost, you know, and so, but there's so much that we also do know and that we can find out again by, by testing it and bringing it back. So it's, it's been really fascinating to see the way that people can take these historic recipes and find a connection to it today. whatever, it's a handful or a sprinkling of or mm -hmm. something, which, which means that you, you either need to try it a few times to get it just right or you need to have some way as an experienced um, chef or cook to figure out what that actually means, right? You, when, you, when you come across a recipe like that that gives you very, you know what the ingredients are, but you're not quite sure what the mix should be, sure, where do you start? And, and this goes back to what I was talking about, about people knowing how to cook. You, Anybody can follow a recipe, but knowing how to cook involves having a certain set of basic skills. Um, knife skills, uh, knowing the difference between roast and braise, you know, um, how to make a stock. Uh, the French word for, for stock is fond. It comes from the exact same Latin root as foundation. It literally is the foundation of Western cuisine. So, and most people don't know how to make it. But yes, I had, I had, uh, have a, quite a few recipes from ancestors of mine, no notably my, my father's mother, um, who has one recipe that starts with take a bottle of cream. No indication whatsoever as to how big the bottle of cream is. Um, and there's a, one for her uh, Thanksgiving cranberries uh, that says simmer until they look about right. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, and sadly, I mean, she died when I was only one. I never, I never got to know her except through her recipes. Mm -hmm. So I had to, uh, had to figure this stuff out for myself. But as I was saying earlier, this isn't difficult work. Any, anybody can do it. I'm living proof that anybody can do it. And it, it saddens me that people, that there are so many people who don't find passion in this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, speaking for myself, it can come from 
terrible disappointment. You have, if you're a cook who doesn't consider yourself terribly proficient, but you think, you know, I can do this, and you, and you start something, and you spend hours trying to make it, and maybe it's sort of okay, but not very good, or you realize somewhere along the way that something in here just didn't work out right. It's very, for me, it's very disheartening, and I think, oh, you know, you do have to be. Uh, a rocket surgeon, and as you said this, earlier. It, there's this horrible um, thing that we have in this country, um, and I don't know what the Latin term for the phobia would be, but it's a, it's a fear of food. And I've never understood this idea. People are afraid to try new things. They're af afraid of any sort of food that isn't, nor you know, normally what they grew up with. You know, it's uh, stereotypical Depression-era Iowa food, brown, hot, and plenty of it. And it... What's the worst thing that could happen if you try to, if you taste something that you've never tasted before? The worst thing that could happen is you'll have a flavor in your mouth that's disagreeable that you're not real fond of and it's going to last about 15 seconds. That's the worst thing that could happen. There are so many other things in this world to be afraid of. Don't be afraid of food. Take chances, taste new things. Try try stuff out and go ahead and try to make uh, cheese at home yourself. It's not as hard as you think. And there's so many other wonderful things that you can discover and things that you can share with, the, with your family and your friends and the people you love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what, what's the craziest thing you've made, would you say, Kristen? The craziest thing I've made? Well, um, I really like to be inspired by my travels. So my husband and I went to uh, Italy. We went to a couple places in Italy in 2009. And I came home and was inspired to make um, homemade pasta with um, seafood pasta a la scoglio, I believe. Is that how you would say it? <laughs> That's how I said it in my mind. I'm surprised I could speak English. So yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, so that was like, you know, I'd never made homemade pasta before, you know. It, but it's like, just try. What's the worst thing that can happen? I waste, you know, half an hour in flour and an egg and some oil and salt, you know. Um, but it turned out really well and um, for my first try anyway. And it's just, you know, I, I think I mentioned before the pride of trying. And even if it didn't come out, the, you know, the way I had in Italy, it came out pretty darn well for my first try in my kitchen in Iowa. What are the, uh, the questions you get? What kinds of questions do you get from your readers? Um, I get a lot of uh, new cooks, too. So I just had someone comment on my blog just the other week. They said, I have never had soup um, not from a can, and never. And um, from a couple of other things she said, I gathered that she was probably in her 20s, and she had never had soup that didn't come from a can. And she tried one of my, um, my grandmother's chicken noodle soup recipe, and she said it was the best soup I've ever had. And she goes, I don't know why I've been scared for so many years. Uh, you know, this opens up so many doors for me, and I was just so excited for her. Um, I made, I made soup at home just a couple of days ago, and m my wife walked into the house, and she said, there is nothing in the world that smells more like home than chicken soup. Yeah. 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 And, and that's the thing, too, is I think, um, you know, we're sharing recipes, of course, but we're also sharing memories, like you touched on in the last panel. Um, and, you know, for me, I always try and include a story as to why I'm, I'm sharing this recipe, and it's not just because... I'm not sharing the soup recipe because it's winter and it's really cold and you want something warm when you get home. I'm sharing it because this recipe means a lot to me and here's why. My grandmother, my grandmother had it ready for me and my family every time we drove in from Ohio. And, and I knew I could count on that chicken noodle soup every time we got in. And yeah, it tastes really good and your family's going to love it, but um, maybe you can start making new memories with this recipe too. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting is that sense of memory and connection also comes through even when the person's cookbook is from 200 years ago. When you go page by page by page, you get a sense of that person through the food that they wrote down. And, uh, and that absolutely carries through from then to now. Sure, better than walking a mile in the other person's shoes. Eat, eat the food that they eat. That's, if you are what you eat, then knowing the other person means knowing their food. There was a, a favorite quotation from a Chinese philosopher named Lin Yutang who said, what is patriotism but love of the food we ate as children? Yeah. Food is home. Food yeah. is love. Yeah. Now, in respect to these uh, pieces we have collected at the university libraries, who can see these? Uh, absolutely anyone. 
So we're open from 8.30 to 5, Monday through Friday, with evening hours on Thursdays until 7. And all you need is the inspiration to walk to the third floor in the main library. <laughs> and, uh, There's an elevator. <laughs> you don't even have to take the stairs. <laughs> And uh, all of them are cataloged in our catalog that you can access online or just talk to one of the librarians and we'll help you find anything from $14.99 to the present. Um, it's interesting the mix of people that come in. Everything from students working on historic projects to local chefs looking for a recipe um, and, and everything in between um, from genealogists to, to local cooks. Yeah. And it's Disneyland can, for people like me. Oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah, when, it can, can individual people actually touch these materials? Or, or are some of these so special, so prized, that you can't really even let them be held by? Yeah. Oh, no. You absolutely can touch mm -hmm. them. Um, I mean, we're, we're a living collection. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you can't go back to the shelves. We bring them out one at mm -hmm. a time for you. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, no, they're there to be used, to be researched, from um, to be part of our everyday life that you can learn from. Mm -hmm. um, People could copy out a recipe, or you could even Xerox it, maybe? Yep. So we'll, we'll Cameras, expect some of these Shathmari collection. Uh, oh, sure. We, we wrote them up. Yeah. Shameless, yeah. shameless oh, plug time. My, mm -hmm. uh, the magazine yes. that I publish, Edible Isle River Valley, we, we wrote up the collection there the last spring, I oh, think right, it was. Yeah. Great. And I want to talk to you after about another idea I've got. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we're about at the end of this segment, so I want to say thank you very much to Kurt Fries, to Colleen Tyson, and to Kristen Porter for joining us. Really wonderful to talk to you all. And I hope that all of you in the audience can join us for part three in this program, uh, which will be uh, coming up in just a moment, where we're going to talk about interconnectedness between food and culture. Uh, World Canvas programming is available on YouTube, iTunes, UITV, and the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. And you can check out Film Scene at icfilmscene.org. I'm Joan Kerr, and thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Good night. <laughs>